I'm really happy to be here, and I'm impressed with Mary Greeley and whoever had the bright, bright idea. Is that the, just the bright idea symbol or something? <laughs> Oh, okay, thank you very much. It, she said bright idea and the light went on. And, and so I thought, boy, they've really got this theme down about encouraging bright ideas. Um, I wanna make sure before we really start, I wanna make sure that you're all at least a little bit aware of ISU extension. Being in this town, of course you're aware of ISU, but actually in this town it's easier for people not to know much about Extension, which is the outreach arm of the university. We have an office in every county of the state, and our job is to bring information and educational programming to the entire state that is practical, research-based, and not commercially biased. Um, and we do that through a number of, of mechanisms. We do programs like this where we come to a group. Um, we do some programming where we offer a program to the public and they come to us. Um, we also provide information through other mechanisms. We have a lot of publications. Um, the one you have is one example. Um, there are some others that some of you already picked up. I'll, I'll tell you about them. You might not all want them. Um, and so we have publications and print material and material online. Um, in addition, we do outreach in other mechanisms as well. For example, over the phone, um, we have, for one thing, you can call your local extension office, which here in Story County is located in Nevada. It's right near the fairgrounds in Nevada. Um, you can call your local extension office with any question that you think extension might have an answer to. And if the person who can answer that question isn't in the office, th that office will put you in touch with the right person. We also have several hotlines. And you will find um, back there, there's a hotline card that lists all of our hotlines. Um, they are over a wide range of topics and very useful. Um, I brought magnets for one of our hotlines, and that's the Iowa Concern Hotline. It's a 24 hour a day, seven day a week hotline, which is not all of these are, most aren't in fact, but this one's 24 seven. Um, it's designed to deal with issues that create stress. <laughs> so, big task. Um, they won't, you know, it's not like a miracle thing that if you call them, everything will be fine. But it is a place you can call if you need someone to talk to to kind of sort things through. Um, and then they can help you figure out where to turn for additional help or other support. Um, you don't have to need someone to talk to. You can just be calling for a specific piece of information or do you know where in my community I could get help with X? One of the reasons I always bring that magnet is as a family finance specialist, um, all the, the, you know, lots of financial topics have legal aspects to them as well. And at the Iowa Concern Hotline, there's an attorney on staff. He's not 24-7, but he's, he's on staff. He returns calls. Mostly, we, you know, people call anonymously, but if you can leave your name and then they'll return a call to you, um, or they'll tell you when you might catch him in. Um, things like landlord-tenant problems, or I'm getting divorced, what's that gonna mean? Or I, I am being treated badly on my job. None of you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, or, but your spouse perhaps, um, or, or a consumer complaint that you can't get resolved. He, he won't give you legal advice. He doesn't take any cases. It's not like legal aid. But he can tell you what the law says, what your options might be, what steps you might want to take, if there's a government agency that would be an appropriate contact. If you should write a letter to the offending party, he can help you think about what words to put in that letter. Um, it's a really nice opportunity to be able to talk to an attorney for free. After you've talked to him, you might find out you need an attorney. And so, but then at least you know that you're not wasting your money and time going to an attorney. And you might also find some steps you can take on your own without an attorney. So I like to make sure people are aware of that resource. Um, the other thing I didn't mention that's on the slide, we, we do programming in a wide range of areas. Um, our biggest program area is agriculture, which was kind of the founding area of extension. We are also um, Act, we have a, a major presence in youth outreach through 4-H. 4-H isn't our only youth program, but it's our most well-known youth program. Um, we have materials and, and information for business and industry and for communities. 
The part of extension that I work with is the part that focuses on the needs of families. And every county has three family specialists that serve the county. One is a nutrition and health specialist, one is a family life specialist, and the third one is somebody like me, a family finance specialist. And then we have multiple counties. I have nine counties that I serve. Anyway, that's how, that's how extension works, and we want to make sure you're aware of how to reach us. Also, I realized I don't have a slide that has our website on it, but if you pick up the hotline card, the website's on the hotline card. All right, so this is what we're here to talk about, the first in a series, money management. Don't be intimidated by the camera. If I'm not going to be intimidated by it, you shouldn't either. I am interested in hearing from you. Please, please be willing to talk. Um, what do you think money management means? Or what does it include? Or what does a money manager do? Or how can you tell if somebody's managing well? 100 good answers. They have enough money to buy what they, have enough money to get what, buy what they need to buy. Another answer. Oh, having an emergency fund. Planning ahead for, for long-term goals such as retirement. More examples? If they don't rely on credit. Any other ideas about what it takes to be a good money manager? Budgeting. Okay, the magic, the B word. That is the word. Um, I mean, that's the, the essence of money management, actually. Um, there are, those were all fabulous answers. Um, there are complex definitions of money management. There are diagrams, people do research, you know, it's, it can be very technical. But even the researchers, the, the definition they like best is this one. Money management is using what you have to get what you want. And actually, if you pick up the bookmark that's over there, which I forgot to mention, but that's our money blog, that's right on the back of our bookmark. Um, using what you have to get what you want. It doesn't say that you will get everything you want, and I always need to point that out. Nobody gets everything they want. But if you're a good money manager, you're using what you have to work with to get the things you want the most. And we'll deal more with that as we go on. First, I want to ask you, about small money. Um, what are some things people spend just a little bit of money at a time on? Coffee at Bergie's. Yes. Lunch. Snacks. OK, all sorts of possibilities, right? Um, if I don't really know any of you, suppose I asked you for a dollar, like, I said, oh my gosh, I need a dollar. Quick, can I have a dollar? You'd probably, if you had one, you'd probably give me one. Even though I'm a stranger, I'm not a complete stranger. Um, at least someone in the room would. And um, I think I would do the same. But all of us, if somebody kept asking us for a dollar over and over and over again, say I asked a coworker for a dollar every morning, every afternoon, every day, all, you know, all month long, that would add up to real money. And my coworker, her head would be doing the little math saying, wait a minute, this is really adding up, right? Now, do you suppose I ever ask myself for a dollar over and over and over again? Yes. Do, does the math, the little calculator in my head tick as well when I'm asking myself? No. <laughs> no, and I see you're all agreeing with me. Um, I'd like to have you look in, in your little um, booklet thing. We aren't going to use this whole booklet. We'll use three three spots in it, I think. Um, but the rest of it is good, too. Turn to page 14. Um, this is a list of some of the things that people spend little money at a time on. And, and somebody pointed out at the earlier session, it still says VCR, which is like really old. And, and we actually updated this, and whoever edited it missed that. Um, but anyway. Some things aren't on here, including coffee, which is really kind of a mistake. But you notice also there's space at the bottom. You can add things. I would ask you, each of you, to take a minute, pick one thing on that list or something not on that list, and think about how much you spend when you do it and how often you do it, and then figure out how much it costs in a year. Now, the, the, the worksheet takes you through a monthly process. If it's something you do weekly, you can just take a weekly figure and times it by 52. 
and I really mean it, and I do have some calculators, so just take a minute and do that. Okay, and was anyone surprised? Now the first thing I need to make sure I remember to say, I almost forgot to say it this earlier, um, I am not here to tell anybody that you shouldn't spend money on those things. All of these things are things, as long as you're of age, they're perfectly okay ways to spend your money. Um, the point isn't to say, no, don't do it. The point is to just be aware of how much you're spending so that you know what your options are. So I didn't put in a slide that had an actual example worked out, but suppose I spend a dollar a day on pop, and I actually probably spend more than that on pop. Um, that's $365 in a year, right? That's you know, not something that you take lightly. If I was going to spend $365 all in one chunk, I'd think about that. But if I spend it a dollar at a time over the course of the year, I don't. That's, that's what the purpose of this exercise is. And, and I like to start with this exercise to get us thinking. Um, it's, it's not a new phenomenon for human beings. Even 200 or so years ago, Ben Franklin said, beware of little expenses, because a small leak can sink a great ship. Um, so we know that this was an issue even in our colonial times. Um, but it's something just to think about. Now, how many of you ever say this? Raise your hand if you say you can't afford it. OK. Um, do you ever say you can't afford it in the grocery store? Especially if you shop with kids, right? <laughs> Five dollar box of cereal. Nope, can't afford that. Or you look in the meat counter at the really, really nice steaks. Uh, Eight dollars a pound. Nope, nope, can't afford that. Um, and there are other bigger things that we can't afford that we say we can't afford. You know, a car repair or a or a new curtains for the living room or something. Um, most of the time when we say that, we're lying. There are some things I can't afford. There's a certain level of house I can't afford to live in. There's a certain kind of car I can't afford to drive. I know that. But most of the time when I say I can't afford something, it's not true. The truth is, I could afford it, but I choose not to spend the money on it. And that's a really important distinction to make. I could buy those steaks, even if they were $10 a pound. I could buy them, but I have something else more important that I want to spend my money on. I, I really want to, um, especially those of you who shop with kids or who, who deal with kids and money, I would encourage you to think about using that language with kids instead of saying you can't afford it. Um, because, and we'll, there's another session on kids and money later, but in that way, you're helping the kids see that life is about making choices. Um, if we say we can't afford it, even if we're not dealing with kids, just for our own sake, uh, if we say we can't afford it, we feel bad. We feel like, oh, poor me, you know, whatever. Um, the, the story that actually caused me, this is my own invention, this little deal, okay? Um, the story that actually caused me to realize this was a young woman I was working with one-on-one -on -one when I had a, a job a long time ago in an agency, um, and she was just feeling terrible because she was going to a wedding, some family wedding, and she was going to have to wear the same old things she'd worn to the last 10 big family events. She just felt crappy that she couldn't afford a new dress. And I asked her, well, what, what did you do with your money this month? And she told me she paid the rent and the other bills. Um, she bought her son. She was a single mom. She bought her son uh, a, a pair of shoes because he needed one. Um, they went out to pizza. I think it was pizza. could have been something else, you know, on the weekend. And I asked her, would you do it differently if you had it to do over again? And her answer was no. Um, she, and yet, she was feeling so bad. She had made really great decisions with her money. But she was feeling bad because she was going to be stuck wearing the same dress that she'd worn to the last 10 things. Now, I hope that I also got creative and you know, helped her think about, I don't remember this part, helped her think about, well, you know, could you get a new belt or a scarf or something to make it different? But 
The point was she needed to feel good about the choices she was making instead of feeling bad about them. Now sometimes it's the other way around. I had other clients who couldn't pay their phone bill. Well, what did you do with your money? And they told me all sorts of things. And they needed to feel a little more bad about how they'd spent their money if they couldn't pay their phone bill. But we need to be aware of our choices. And that's, that's the theme of this whole hour session. So we're back to this idea of using what you have to get what you want. And I'd like to start, and I can go on too long about this, so I have to watch. Um, I'd like to start talking about what you have to work with. When you're managing your money, what do you have to work with? Your paycheck, right. Anything else? You have your expenses, right. Child support, you might have child support. You might have some other source of income, right. You might have a, some work you do on the side. Maybe you bake wedding cakes. So some months you have extra money when you're baking wedding cakes. Um, actually, and that's, that's what we think of. That's what most people think of. We need to learn to think big about everything we have to work with when we're managing our money because we have a lot of different kinds of resources. One kind is economic resources. Many of the things you guys mentioned, nobody mentioned money they might have in savings, though. That's part of what we have to work with when we're managing our money and meeting our, our family's needs. Um, credit, the ability to borrow money, that's part of what we work with, too, when we're managing our money. Um, various kinds of benefits. So economic resources, and even we could have on this list something we own that we could sell. That's another resource that we have available to us if we want to make it available. We also have community resources, and I made the color too light there. Um, but in a community like this, there's tons of resources, parks, libraries, um, public transportation system that's huge, um, different agencies that are available. There's lots of community resources. And then human resources. How many of you can think of a way you use human resources to save money? Do-it-yourself projects. Such as? Do-it-yourself projects such, instead of hiring somebody such as? Painting. Painting, Painting your house yourself. Great example. Other, other examples? Bartering with friends, such as? For daycare or if they or something, I'll cut your kids' hair if you'll watch my kids on Saturday. <laughs> that kind of stuff, yeah. Different skills that people have. I used to, um, when I lived close to my dad, I used to, he would, he would change the oil in my car. He would even buy the oil and and filter, so I know I got a better deal than he did. But he would change the oil in my car, and I would bake him a pie. And that was our deal. And it was wonderful. And my dad liked to keep tabs in my car anyway to make sure it was in good shape. So uh, <laughs> it kept him from worrying, too. Um, various examples. And under human resources, you can't see this, I don't think. But it says skills and also information. If you know the best place to buy something, or if you know that somebody's having a sale, or if you know that this place offers free supper on Wednesday nights or whatever night, um, your health and energy and certain attitudes, that's all part of the resources that you have to work with. Um, sometimes when we need to solve a money management problem, part of the solution is thinking bigger about the resources that we might put to use. And often we just need maybe to get a little help from somebody. Not necessarily financial help, sometimes just time help. The second part of that, using what you have to get what you want, is the what you want part. Um, page two, there's a spot there to write down what your goals are. It's a very small spot, however. Um, and I think the theory is that we would write down our highest priority goals. But you all have lots of goals, right? What's an example of a goal somebody might have? Yes, ma'am. You don't want to live paycheck to paycheck, so you want some money in savings. Yep. OK, great goal uh, and great example. Any other examples? Pay off, the house before you retire. Pay off the house before you retire. Yes. Paying for a wedding. Paying for a wedding. Vacation. Excellent examples. OK. Um, all of those are examples. Retirement was mentioned earlier as an example. Sending kids to college. There's all sorts of different kinds of examples of goals. I don't think I've ever had anyone mention the
these, this kind of a goal, something like, I like my kids to get new clothes in, you know, seasonally, um, as opposed to used clothes. Or our family likes to go out for pizza once a week or once a month, or those kinds of things. But those kind of lifestyle, day-to-day -day things, those are also goals. Um, and it's important to be aware of all those kinds of goals, because if you can't have everything you want, you want to see what you have to work with so you know what you could trade away. <laughs> um, and that's, so, so I always think that if someone's doing a, a list of goals, you know, this little box is here, and this is a good place to write your high priority goals. But I would start with a whole big blank sheet, sheet of paper. <laughs> and I would just keep writing. And it's going to take some days or weeks to think of everything that's important to you, because you have some things that come to mind right away. But other things that are important to you might not occur to you till later. And I'm not saying that you should consciously work on all those goals all at once. But it is helpful to see the big picture. And when you have to choose what's more important than what else, you can sort of see, well, this is really important to me. Maybe this isn't. And so I can put less priority on this, or only go out to pizza every other week. Or instead of going out for pizza, we can order it in, and then we drink our own beverages, and it costs less. So there's a variety of ways to think about goals. Our goals um, involve our needs and our wants. I mean, what we want includes our needs and our wants and our goals. And I just think they're all the same thing. If you need something, you want it. If you, if you need something or want something, it's a goal. It's really all one big picture. It's not like this black and white difference between needs and wants. Um, it's more of a shades of gray kind of thing. So my personal philosophy says we might as well just think of those all together rather than dividing them into separate boxes. But if it's useful to you to divide them into separate boxes, that's cool too. When finances are tight, and even when they're not, um, you need to select your highest priorities. You, you, you can't have everything you want. But I, I, I do think even Bill Gates probably can't have everything he wants. For him, it's a matter of what charitable, charitable causes he can support to the extent he would like to support them. But even Bill Gates can't have everything he wants. But for most of us, it's a lot more basic than that. To make a goal really useful, this is not in your book, I'm sorry to say. Um, you may have heard this before, the idea of SMART goals. A SMART goal, the S-M-A-R-T, Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Realistic, and Time-Defined. Um, specific. Somebody mentioned vacation. That's a common one. Um, but what's a vacation? That's not a very specific goal. When you say you're saving up for a vacation, you may know exactly what you mean. You may know what, what a vacation is for your family. You may know that every year you go to the lake for a week, and, and that's, that's what that is. But for one person who says vacation, um, you know, it might be a month in Europe. For somebody else, it might be a long weekend visiting their sister in Sioux City. You know, I mean, they're completely different when it comes to the finances of it. So um, being as specific as you can. If you need a new vehicle, be as specific as you can about what you're looking for in a vehicle, even before you start identifying certain models, that kind of thing. Measurable, usually we measure goals. Measurable is useful so we can see that we're making progress towards our goals. Usually we measure financial goals in dollar figures. I need a million dollars by the time I retire, so I need to do this much. And then you know, at such and such an age, I should have this much saved up. And then it should gradually increase and build towards that um, million dollars or whatever figure I have set on. Um, occasionally, though, some of our financial goals are measured differently. They're measured by our behavior, like I'm going to um, pay all my bills on time. I'm not going to have any more late fees. I'm going to pay everything on time. Or I'm going to bounce my checkbook every night, or I'm going to do it every Wednesday night, or whatever. Um, measured. So sometimes it's behaviors. Attainable means just that we divide it into steps. Um, if I said I need this huge chunk of money to retire, that's unattainable. You know, I mean, it, it, we have to break it down into steps. Otherwise, we will never see that we can accomplish that. Realistic is very important. That month in Europe, um, suppose that was important to me. And suppose I said, OK, I'm going to save up so I can spend a month in Europe this summer. I can tell you that's not realistic. Um, 
what would happen is if I started saving up and got getting, getting my thoughts thinking, okay, I'm saving for my month in Europe this summer, it wouldn't happen. And when summer came and went and I didn't go to Europe, I might say, well, to heck with saving, to heck with planning, to heck with spending budgeting, this doesn't work. Um, you need to make a goal that is possible for you to achieve. Otherwise, you'll just give up. So keep that in mind. And then being time bound or time specific, again, I'm going to come back to that month in Europe. If I said I want to spend a month in Europe after I retire, which is maybe 15 years from now, I'm not as old as my white hair makes me look, um, then that could be realistic. So when you put it, so one of the ways you sort of finagle and finesse your goals and your goal accomplishment is by playing with timelines too. Okay, I really want a better car. So maybe if I can wait two more years, then I can save up more money so that I can get a better car instead of just having to get a car now and not get as nice a car as I'd like. Okay, that by, by changing the deadline, that's another way we can make goals realistic and get what we want. Finally, I want to mention finally about goals, Kali. Um, I do like to encourage people to think about financial security with regard to their goals. When we think financial security, one thing we think about is long-term financial security. And some of you mentioned saving for retirement earlier. Um, but I picked this picture on purpose. I love these, these guys. They've got their telescope out and they're looking far into the future where there's stars. You know, it's every, everything is wonderful and starry-eyed. And they don't even notice that they're standing on the edge of a cliff. There's lots and lots of people who are saving for these long-term big fancy goals, you know, um, big house, kids to college, great retirement, and they don't have anything in place for short-term financial security. Short-term financial security is made up of these primarily. Your income stability, which you may or may not have a lot of control over. Your emergency savings. Three to six months is the recommended emergency savings, and we may have time later to talk about that, or we may not. Insurance and your ability to get credit, and that's our topic for another month. All of those are things to consider, and one of the handouts that's on this table over here is a financial security checklist that deals with those short-term financial security components. So that's an option. You can pick it up if you want. All right, so I spent too much time there, but as we think about goals, you want to you wanna really focus on what's most important to you. And ultimately, when you're at the end of the month or the end of the year, you want to be able to look back and be satisfied with what you did with the money you've got. Um, so let me see. We've got our steps. Step one is to know what you have. Step two is to know what you want. Step three, make a plan. How many of you have ever made a spending plan or a budget? Spending plan, budget, same thing. Budget's kind of an ugly word like diet, so maybe spending plan's more uh, palatable. Um, making a spending plan is not really very hard. In your um, this little book, there are some tools. There's not actually a spending plan worksheet, though, but there are some other tools that you can do. Personally, I always make spending plans on a blank sheet of paper. Or if you use Excel, you know, you might do an a Excel spreadsheet. Um, when you're making a spending plan, you start with your income, um, how much you can reliably count on to receive each month. Um, you might have income from a variety of sources. I always recommend that if you have some income that's unreliable, like maybe child support that doesn't always come, or sporadic, like uh, the, the baking wedding cakes, the, the self-employment income, or overtime. Sometimes you have overtime, sometimes you don't. I always encourage people to make their spending plan with the income they can count on. Don't forget about the other income. But first of all, figure out if, the, if only the basic income is there, this is my plan. Then have a plan on the side so that if the child support check does come, if I do bake some wedding cakes, if I win the lottery, it, whatever, um, that these are the first things I'm going to do with the extra money that might come. If there's overtime, and that's helpful because it makes sure that you have thought about what to do with that money. Sometimes people say, yeah, so you don't blow it. And really, I don't think mostly people blow their money. But what happens is they usually spend it, I mean, if they have extra money, they spend it on the first useful thing that comes to mind instead of necessarily the most useful thing. 
And if you've planned in advance about and really thought about it in the context of your other spending plan, then you'll have given some thought to identifying the, the highest priorities. So we need to think about our income. And then we need to think about our expenses. And that includes how much, I mean, that starts with how much we have been spending up till now. How many of you know exactly where all your money goes? Yeah, I didn't think so. I don't even know where all my money goes. I know where most of my money goes. But, um, but we need to, in order to make a spending plan, we need to kind of think through where has our money been going. And we may be referring back to old records for that. Uh, we may be doing a, a lot of things. We may rely on our memory some at least the first time, because we might not have any other records. And memory is better than nothing. Use your calendar, too. That can help. Um, when we're looking at expenses, we start with fixed and flexible expenses. You guys know. You've heard these. Many of you have heard these before. What's, what's an example of, what are some examples of fixed expenses? Mortgage or rent are fixed expenses. Water, gas bill. OK. Car payment, yep. A fixed expense is anything that's the same amount every month and the s due every month and due um, on the same date every month. And, and it might not be exactly the same date or even slightly different amounts. Utilities are tricky because they tend to go up and down a little. But if they're close, they are fixed expenses in the sense that they are due every month on the same, more or less the same date. And then we have flexible expenses. What would be some flexible expenses? Entertainment. Lunch money, medical, OK, maybe. Groceries, gas for the car, OK. Flexible expenses are the things we can change on a dime. We might have started out the month planning that we'd spend $100 a week on groceries. And then something changed, and all of a sudden, we're going to spend only $80 a week on groceries <laughs> because we needed to spend some money somewhere else. Um, it's be because it's not fixed in stone. Now, it's important to point out, actually, fixed expenses aren't really written in stone. But it takes a bit more to change those. You have to renegotiate the loan, or you have to put in a lot of energy efficiency things so your utility bills go down, or there, there are things you can do. So you can, or you can move to a different place to live in order to bring your rent down. But, so they're harder to change, but they're not written in stone. There's this third kind of <coughs> expense, though, called periodic expense. And this is completely apart from the unexpected, the emergencies. Okay? These, right now, we're talking about the expenses we can plan for. Periodic expenses are anything that doesn't come monthly but is predictable, something that might come once a, once a quarter, once a year, twice a year. What would be some examples? Oil changes, insurance payment. House taxes, subscriptions, subscriptions yes. memberships, Your license car tags, car license plates. I missed one. Uh, those are great examples. On page nine, there's a little worksheet. It looks like this. Um, it, in my experience, it's often the periodic expenses that are the trigger that caused people to realize that they aren't in as, as good a control of their finances as they thought they were. I have literally had people say to me, well, everything was fine until back to school time came. Literally, I had people say that to me. Everything wasn't fine. If you weren't ready for back to school, then everything wasn't fine. The thing with these expenses is that we know they're coming, and we can be prepared for them. And if we want to make our lives better, we want to be ready for them. So the first step in being ready for them is to, or at least one way to be prepared. This is not the only method, but it's probably the most systematic method, is to use a chart like this. Um, or you can just have a list on a sheet of paper month by month. But as you can see, there's a column for each month of the year, and then there are rows for different kinds of periodic expenses, most of the things you guys mentioned. Um, <clears throat> just filling out this chart can be a big eye opener. Like You can suddenly say, oh my gosh, I knew September was bad. But now I see that August was a little bad too. So no wonder, and September's worse than I ever even realized. I have more due in September than I even realized. So no wonder I'm always just falling to pieces in August and September. Um, so the first step is to just fill out the form. 
And a less systematic way of being in control, uh, or at least kind of getting a ha handle on these, when you first fill them out, fill it out, chances are the expenses will be really up and down. You know, nothing in, tons in January, nothing in February, way up and down throughout the year. A lot of people informally take care of these by um, either paying their six month car insurance early. <laughs> like, okay, it's not due till June, but I know I have some other expenses in June, so I'm gonna pay it in May. Or buying birthday presents or Christmas presents at you know other months so when they have extra money. So what we do if we're, <clears throat> if we're doing that kind of informal adjusting is we're taking it from peaks and, and valleys down to more rolling hills. It's still gonna be some ups and downs, but not nearly as dramatic. That's not a fully systematic way of doing it, but it can work. It can work, so you know that is a method. A really solid method is to fill this out, and suppose we add up all the figures then on our sheet, and we get a total of $2,280 for the year. Just suppose, your number would be different. That averages out to $190 a month. So instead of having this crazy up and down stuff, just set aside $190 a month, and never use it for anything except the, the expenses that were on this list. Sounds sensible, right? Have some of you ever done that? I did it last year. And I did, um, we were taking Thanksgiving vacation and I did Christmas. I just tried four things. Uh -huh. And I put $100 for Christmas in every month, 100 in for vacation like that. And when I went on vacation, which was just four days in Dallas, I had $1,200 to spend. And I went Black Friday shopping and I didn't use a credit card. <laughs> Wonderful, great. great example. So she didn't maybe use all her, her periodic, maybe you have other periodic expenses too that you just yeah, cash flow, just but you picked a few key things. And, and if you have a routine vacation, that is another really good example of something to put on this worksheet. Christmas is huge, yeah. And that's what she, what she just said is, is, is really important. It, Christmas was painless. You know, none of that January bill shock, none of that. That's the big, <clears throat> that's a wonder of using this kind of a method is that all that stress and drama that you experience and all the late fees or all the struggling or begging your mom, please let me borrow some money, I promise I'll pay it back this time, or, or whatever it might be, um, all that is gone. The bill comes, transfer the money, make the payment, no problem. No stress, no drama. So here's how it might, oh, there is one trick about that though. Suppose this family that I was talking about here, the pretend one, this actually comes from a, a more filled out example. Um, and in the particular example, June and July are the terrible months. They've got like $350 of expense in June and six or 700 in July. So those are terrible months, considering that it's 190 a month average. Um, if they started this plan in May, Eh, not gonna get them there, right? Timing is an issue. I really love the fact that I'm talking to you right now on February 27th because if you haven't gotten it already, you may soon be getting a tax refund. And having some seed money for, for a periodic expense fund can be a wonderful use for part of your tax refund. Um, it, it depends on the situation and the timing. Typically, I suggest that people might put away two or three months worth as seed money. So for this family, maybe 500 bucks. If they start their little savings fund with 500 bucks seed money and then start the 190, then they're gonna be okay on the ins and outs and ups and downs, regardless of the timing. It does depend, but, but that is a common example. Here I have an example um, for this particular example, this family, if they started the, in January with seed money of 200, then they would come out okay. So that was lower seed money just because of the luck of timing. But they start with that seed money, they put their 190 in in January, they pay out $200 in car insurance. February, they put their 190 in, there's no bills, but they still put the 190 in. March, they put 190 in, they have a birthday, they spend some money on the birthday. By the end of March, they've got 550 bucks and they can, the example can continue throughout the year and it will cash flow. So um, seed money can make starting a periodic expense savings fund a lot easier. If you don't have seed money, if you don't have a tax refund, that doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means that the, the path will be a little rocky the first year, <laughs> that's all. It's a really, a really nice strategy. 
So we want to build into our spending plan some savings, periodic expense savings like we just talked about, savings for important future things, uh, for a vacation, for a new computer, for uh, an addition on the house, for whatever it is that you want to be saving for. Um, also emergency funds. And um, I, just a comment, three to six months expenses, enough so that you could live for three to six months. That's a recommended emergency fund. Um, unemployment can be longer than six months, so lots of experts have been talking about a year or two years. If a person lives on two, or a household lives on $2,000 a month, then a six month emergency fund is $12,000. That's a daunting goal for somebody who's starting from scratch. So I always encourage people, if you're starting from scratch, Start by getting a week. <laughs> I mean, this doesn't apply to you guys, most of you at least. It, um, but for people who don't have sick leave on the job, maybe they're part-time workers at the corner store or whatever, having a one-week emergency fund in case they got sick and didn't get a paycheck for a week, a one-week emergency fund is very valuable. Start by getting yourself a one-week emergency fund. Build it up to two weeks or half a month. Work from there to a month. And getting a one-month emergency fund, if you're in a pretty tight situation, that could take a year or two, especially if other emergencies come along along the way, like car repair or something. Um, it could take a long time. But if you can watch it you know, and see the progress and know that you're getting there, a one-month emergency fund has great value and puts you quite a few steps ahead of a lot of other people. So anyone who's starting from scratch with an emergency fund, I would not encourage you to start with a three to six month goal because that's going to feel overwhelming. I would start and pat yourself on the back when you get to a week and two weeks and a month and then grow from there if you can. Um, okay, so to make a spending plan, we start with our income, we look at our different expenses, including planning for unanticipated things. Um, and that we look at the past and then we make a plan going forward. Um, when we're making that plan, we all need to make a spending plan thinking about a month, because most bills come once a month. Um, depending how people get paid, sometimes that doesn't match up. I get paid once a month. Some of you may get paid once. I don't know how you get paid here. I didn't ask. Um, but if people get paid weekly, they, they probably need a weekly plan, too. They need to figure out the one month plan, but then they need to figure out the week by week, what are they going to spend on what, so they know how much they can, sh can put towards groceries this week when there's a lot of bills due and they can plan ahead because one week's paycheck might not be enough to pay all the bills that are due the first week of the month. So a week by week plan is also a, a good idea for people who get paid weekly. Be realistic. If you discover that you've been spending $700 a month on groceries and you say, no way, I'm not spending $700 a month on groceries, you say, I'm going to just plan for $350. Well, your family's not going to probably be able to eat on 350 depending on your family. If it's just one person, you can eat on 350 even two probably. But if it's a, $700 a month on groceries is not on the line for a, fa a family with kids. Um, so make sure you don't set yourself up for failure. Make sure you um, make a spending plan that has a chance of succeeding. If a family that's been spending $700 a month on groceries tries to spend $350, they might get by the first month because they have stuff in the freezer and stuff in the cupboards. But they won't make the second month because that's not enough to, to meet their needs. Also, make sure your plan has some flex money in it because you can plan, but you can't know what unexpected things are going to come up. So have a place where you've got uh, some fudge factor built in. All right. <clears throat> know what you have, know what you want, make a plan, follow the plan. Aha! Lots and lots of people have said to me, well, I don't know, some people have said to me, oh, I've tried managing my money, it didn't work. And you ask them a little bit more about it, and a lot of times they didn't do step one and two, they didn't do step four, all they did was make a plan. What was the point of putting that work into making a plan if you're not going to follow it? The, the plan is there to help you accomplish the things that you wanted to do. So of course you want to try to follow a plan. How many of you have had experiences where you had trouble following a plan? Yeah. It, it doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen that you make a plan and you can follow it. You need some system for keeping track of where your money's going so that 
so that you can know that you're staying within the limits that you set. There are different methods. The time-honored, you know, ancient method, still completely appropriate, um, if although not as many people use it anymore, is the old accounting book, ledger book, like this. Um, and you can get books like this at office supply stores and that kind of thing. Uh, for, yeah, for people who've um, never kept track of their spending and you know, we have computer programs now that will do the adding for you, which is a big plus. Um, they're a lot like this, except it's on computer instead of on paper. If you've never kept track and you don't know what, if it's going to work for you, you don't know what, what fits for you, one thing you might, you might say, I don't know if I want to go spend 30 bucks on a, or 50 bucks on a computer program or, or 10 bucks on a record keeping book. Um, on the back table, there are some week by week worksheets, one week at a time. One of the things I like about this worksheet is that one week at a time isn't intimidating. Okay, I'm just going to do it for this week. And you know, if this week you forget by Wednesday it's over, okay, start fresh next week. There's always a fresh start right around the corner with a one week plan <laughs> tracking sheet. Um, and that might be all you need. Keep track maybe four weeks. Um, that can be a good strategy. There are also um, lots of apps nowadays, applications for the computer and for mobile devices um, that, that you may find useful to you. Back there, there's a, a fact sheet, it's actually white now, um, called Tracking Your Spending that talks about some of the different methods, although it doesn't say much about the newest applications. Um, there's another method that's very concrete, and that's why it has the advantage. How many of you have had experience or at least know about this method? The thing about the envelope method is that you use cash. Some people don't have bank accounts, so they need the envelope method. If you have a bank account, don't use cash for your rent, for heaven's sake. Um, but, but for your spending that you want to keep real tight control on, cash is useful because when it's gone, it's gone. So the theory behind the envelope method is you start out at the beginning of the week or month. In each envelope, say food, gas, and fun, just for simplicity's purpose. You put the amount of money you've got. And you can see as you go through the week or through the month, you can see when you're running out. You can see. And you'll know that, oh, I guess I won't be buying this extra bag of chips because my grocery envelope is almost out of money. Um, it's got a lot of advantages in that respect. Obviously, safety is an issue, you know, in terms of carrying a lot of cash, so you want to think about that. But it's very concrete, very clear. Can be a really useful method for at least certain expenses. All right, the last step in the plan is to think it over for next time. March is just in two days. If some of you decide you want to make a spending plan for March and maybe you've never made a spending plan before, I can tell you it's, it's not likely to be perfect. Um, if it was, it would be amazing. Uh, because you don't know necessarily how you've been spending your money in the past. So at the end of March, you're going to want to think it over, figure out what you learned, figure out what didn't work. Oh, I didn't plan for enough for gas. I, I, you know, I didn't remember that I was going to need to make this other trip, and so I have to plan more for gas. So one of the things I learned is that when I'm planning for the month, I better look at my calendar and see what kind of traveling I need to do. You'll learn lessons along the way. You'll get a better handle on how much you spend in different categories. And you'll decide what you're willing to live with and without, too. So it's always smart to do a regular review. In the first months, you're going to want to review every month. But after a while, you might not need to review every month, but periodically. If you do succeed, even partially, in taking control of your money, you will find that you get more for your money. And you'll be able to make progress towards your goals, including make, uh, being more prepared for emergencies, assuming that was one of your goals. You will also be more likely to be able to say that you spend your money wisely. And I don't mean that somebody else would look at your money and say, oh yeah, you spend your money wisely. Oh, you don't spend your money so wisely. It's not like that. It's you, because this is your money. You're using what you have to get what you want. So you are the only one who can decide if you spend your money wisely. 
Um, but if you are in control of your money, you will be more likely to look back and be satisfied with where your money went. If you find yourself in a difficult financial situation, a difficult management problem where you, I can't figure out how to get what I want out of what I've got, um, the core thing, the, the, there's two core steps that you may need to consider. One is to expand your resources. Sometimes that means getting more money, like getting a part-time job, you know, extra job. But sometimes it means asking for help. I mean, I have stories about how I've gotten help um, in, from a time management standpoint and other, other ways to get me through a difficult situation. Um, so you may want to think bigger about what resources you have to work with. And the other thing is to rethink, reprioritize your goals and say, you know what? This is a serious problem I have here, and I seriously want to accomplish this. And I am, of all the things that are on the plate here, this is the one I'm most willing to give up. And so I'm going to give it up, at least for a while, until I, whatever. So you, need to re, you may need to rethink and reprioritize your goals. And then you should be able to answer this question in the affirmative. Are you satisfied with where your money's going? Sometimes people want rules. And I'm sort of uncomfortable even when I first started using that phrase. I was uncomfortable saying to people, you know what? It's just up to you. If you're satisfied with where your money goes, then that's all just fine. I said, well, are there really, though, some right and wrong ways of spending your money? Because in general, I want to say, there's no right or wrong way to spend your money. But I made myself think about this a little more, and I came up with three rules. Okay. First, I only came up with two, but then I was talking to some teenagers, and I came up with a third one, which was that it has to be legal. Okay, So yes, there's no right or wrong way to spend your money except that it has to be legal. If you have children or anyone else who depends on you, you need to keep them safe and healthy. And there's certain basic things they're going to need. They don't need a new winter coat. They do need a winter coat if you live in Iowa. You know, there are certain things kids need or dependents would need. And if you make a promise, you have to keep it. And if something changes and you can't keep it anymore, you need to renegotiate that promise. So maybe it means, Mom, I know I told you I'd pay $100 a month, so we got this paid off. But would it be OK with you if I only pay 75 You know, it could be that. It could be calling up the cable company and saying, you know, I can't be paying this cable bill anymore, so I'm going to ask you to turn my cable off or back me down to a lower contract or whatever. So those are the three rules that I came up with. And I've been using those three rules for a really long time. And I have a fourth rule if you have a business, a family business. But otherwise, these three rules seem to work. If you follow these three rules, then beyond that, it's up to you. Are you satisfied with where your money goes? But not just short term. Not are you satisfied right now while you're eating the lobster dinner, but will you be satisfied at the end of the month or the end of the year? All right, now I'd like to, this is the last thing here. Um, everything that we spend our money on could be lined up in a row from the super high priority stuff all the way down to the stuff that doesn't matter at all. We all, nowadays spend so much money on, we, we spend money on so many things that we couldn't possibly imagine lining everything up in order. A hundred years ago, people might have been able to do that. They might have been able to take everything they spend money on and line it up in order of priority. But we think of, you know, the very basic food, basic shelter at this end. Somewhere along here comes maybe a second bathroom. Even before that might come a second pair of shoes. <laughs> um, um, somewhere in there comes a little bit of chocolate. And then a little further down comes a little more chocolate, maybe. And, and, and you know, your, everybody's list would be different in terms of what order things were in and where chocolate or something else might fall. But no matter what your order is, what's most important to you, if you're spending money wisely um, and you have things lined up, and suppose we have one, I mean, I'm just identifying three things. We have thing A here, thing B here, but there's lots of other things in between, too, and thing C here. If you're spending money wisely and that green bar is how much money you have, then that's how you're spending your money. You're spending your money on the first 20 things or the first 200 things on your list. And if you get a raise 
then you're spending money on the next 10 or 100 things on your list. So now you get B, right? In the beginning, you only had A. You couldn't get B and C because they weren't as important. But now you can get B because you have enough money to get that far along your list of priorities. Now I want to ask you about this picture. The green shows where you're spending your money in comparison to your priority scale. What can you say about that picture? In that picture, the person is spending money up here on C while they're not buying these things. They're spending money right here while they're not buying B and some other things. They're sp spending money on less important things and leaving more important things undone. Obviously a picture of not so wise spending. That's what we want to avoid. <laughs> we may have a lot of money or a little money, but however much money we have, we want all of it to be lined up on the left-hand side of our continuum. We don't want any money out there where we're spending something on less important stuff. And that's the bottom line here. Smart money managers make smart choices, and that includes making trade-offs. But if you're a smart money manager, you'll always be giving up something less important so that you can put your money for the more important things, whatever is most important according to you. And call. At a certain point in there, I didn't think I was going to make it. But we made it. It's right exactly 4.30. Um, I look forward, hopefully, to seeing some of you again next month. And um, I, I can answer questions if you have them.